On our number 10 spot today, we have the Jackson County John Doe. In 1981, a man was struck by a vehicle and has never been able to be identified. This would have just been a regular, albeit tragic John Doe case, but it really took an even darker turn. In 2014, a newspaper published a morgue photo of this John Doe in an attempt to receive some new leads. Well, they got more than they bargained for when somebody contacted authorities saying that the man looked like one in the FBI's most wanted list. This person thought that the John Doe looked like William Bradford Bishop Jr., who was wanted for taking the lives of his wife, mother, and children in 1976. Because of this tip, the authorities had to exhume the body of the John Doe, who turned out to not be be this killer at all. Unfortunately, the John Doe has still never been identified. He was described as approximately 55 years old, a white male with blue eyes, brown and gray hair, about 5 feet and 9 inches tall, and 155 pounds. Anyone with information on this John Doe should contact the Scottsboro Police Department. In our number 9 spot today, we have the Etowah County John Doe. In 1998, the remains of a young male were found by some men who were fishing. He was estimated to have been around 17 to 21 years old, which is already sad enough, but then they found out that he had been killed by someone else. He had multiple bullet wounds to his head, as well as stab wounds. Scientists did their best to create a facial reconstruction, but they had to estimate his jaw area because his mandible was never found, along with other limbs that were apparently also missing. Because his body was pretty decomposed and had evidence of it being lit on fire, they don't have a ton of descriptive details available, but he is said to have been a black male around 5'6 to 5'9. His remains are stored at the Forensic Anthropology Center at the University of Tennessee. If you have any information, you you can contact Tony Driscoll at the Gadsden Police Department or the Forensic Anthropology Center at the University of Tennessee. In our number 8 spot today, we have this Regina John Doe, who is also known as Dave. This one, you guys, is actually from my own hometown. On July 28, 1995, the Regina police were called to a Canadian Pacific Railway crossing after someone had witnessed a young man walk in front of an oncoming train. He unfortunately took his own life, but authorities could not identify who this man was. There was a composite sketch drawn of him that was put into newspapers, but no one ever came forward with any information that led to a true identification. A hitchhiker came forward a few days after the incident happened and explained that he had traveled to Regina with this man and that he had said that his name was Dave, but little more than that was known about him. The man didn't have any scars or tattoos that could easily identify him, and there weren't any missing people in the area who matched his description. His fingerprints were searched in Canada, the US, and internationally, but no match was ever found. The authorities collected his DNA, dental charts were made with extensive x-rays and photographs in the hope that one day he will be identified. He was described as a white male around 20 to 30 years old with short medium brown hair. He was 5 foot 9 and weighed around 140 to 160 pounds. One thing that doesn't really matter but I found super strange when I read it was that Dave was wearing a pair of size 12 and a half blue and white Reebok runners but his feet were only size 9 and 3 quarters. Again it's not super important but I just thought it was strange and it just left me with an eerie feeling. The Regina Police Cold Case Unit, along with the coroner's office, continue to work on the case, trying to figure out who Dave really was. If anyone has any information, please contact either the Office of the Chief Coroner for South Saskatchewan or the Regina Police Cold Case Unit. In our number 7 spot today, we have a Hamilton John Doe. On Monday, April 9th, 2007, a person was walking their dog when they saw an object laying in the ditch. As they got closer to investigate, they realized that the object was actually a human skull, and they called the authorities. A few days later, the Hamilton police with the search and rescue teams, as well as cadaver dogs, set out to search the area surrounding this gruesome discovery. After only one hour, they were able to find the rest of the remains that matched the skull that had been found. They were never able to confirm a cause of death, and they believe that the death occurred in the summer or fall of 2006, but say that they can't rule out the possibility 
of it having happened in the spring of 2006 or even the fall of 2005. They compared this information to all of the missing persons cases they had, but they have never been able to identify this man or exactly what happened to him. He was 40 to 65 years old, had no upper teeth, he had grey hair that was about 2 to 3 inches long, and was somewhere from 5 foot 6 to 6 feet tall. Any information is asked to be passed to Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-TIPS or to the OPP Missing Persons and Unidentified Bodies Unit. In our number 6 spot today we have the Woodlawn Jane Doe. In September of 1976, a woman who had been killed was discovered in Woodlawn, Baltimore County, Maryland. Whoever took her life was certainly a monster because there are some pretty gruesome details that I'm just not going to go into on this video. She had a large amount of chlorpromazine in her stomach when she was found, which is a drug that is used to treat schizophrenia. It is unclear whether she or the person who did this to her were the ones who were using the drug, but authorities were hoping that it would tie one of them to a mental institution. She had also been wrapped in a sheet that was similar to ones that are provided at inpatient institutions. She had a tattoo of initials that read either JP, SS, or JB, and a scar on her upper right thigh. She may have gone by the name Jasmine or Jazzy. She was somewhere from 15 to 30 years old with dark brown to black shoulder length hair with a dark olive complexion. Her race has actually never been confirmed, but medical examiners believe she was either white or possibly South American. Any tips are asked to be directed to Metro Crime Stoppers by phone, text, or online. In our number five spot today, we have the Garfield Heights John Doe. In 1991, when some children were playing in the woods, they unfortunately stumbled upon human remains. They never actually ended up doing a reconstruction of this John Doe, but I'm not entirely sure why. He was estimated to be from 18 to 21 years old and was a black male. His weight could not be estimated, but he had short black curly hair and was around 5 foot 6. When he was found, he was almost just completely skeleton, and they honestly aren't exactly sure when or how he died. I wish I had more information to share about this man, but unfortunately there just isn't a lot that was known from the get-go. One very notable thing about this case that has stuck with a lot of people is the fact that a note was found in his shoe. The note read, For Daddy, we can't wait to see you. Love, Cynthia and Boo Boo miss you. It is never nice or pleasant for someone to have lost their life, but this note really adds something to this case. It's obvious he had a family that cared a lot about him and who are missing him. Any information is asked to be passed to Thomas Gilson at the Cuyahoga County Coroner's Office. In our number four spot today we have the Jefferson County Jane Doe. In January of 1993, the head of a woman was found in Wayne Fitzgerald State Park. Unfortunately, the rest of her body has never been found, which is both deeply disturbing as well as frustrating since it has left authorities with very little to go on. One thing that they were able to figure out from the head was that whoever this woman was, she suffered from a condition called torticollis or wry neck, which would have caused her head to be slightly tilted towards the left. This is a really rare condition, so people who knew her really should have had an easy time recognizing her, or at least coming forward if they knew anyone with a condition who had gone missing. People think that the head may have been thrown out of a car window as it drove past, which is just so creepy and so upsetting. She would have been somewhere from 30 to 50 years old with shoulder length reddish brown hair. Anyone with information about this case should direct it to the Illinois State Police Zone 7 investigations. In our number 3 spot today we have the Markham Doe. In July of 1980, the skeletal remains of a human were found in Markham, Ontario in Canada. Based on context clues, it is presumed that the doe was a transgender woman, but of course that is just speculation based on the evidence present. In 2009, there was a lead that the doe might have been a person who had been missing from Ontario named Mario Palermo, but unfortunately a DNA test turned out to be negative and the trail went cold again. It wasn't until much later after the body was initially found that they would come to realize this person was most likely a victim of serial killer James Henry Greenbridge. This doe was estimated to be 20 to 50 years old, around 5 foot 4 to 5 foot 7, and somewhere from 99 to 100 
221 pounds. They also had brown hair that was around four inches long. Anyone with information about this case should contact the York Regional Police Homicide and Missing Persons Unit, or more specifically, Detective David McDonald. In our number two spot today, we have the Miami Beach John Doe. In December of 2009, a man was found floating face down by a couple who were walking along the beach in Miami Beach. There weren't any obvious signs of trauma, so authorities really aren't exactly sure what happened to this man or if foul play was involved. One of the most striking things about this case to me is the fact that he was six foot nine. I feel like the average person is not that tall, and coupled with the fact that his face was fully recognizable, I feel like he should have been able to be easily identified. He was wearing swim trunks, so it's possible he may have just been swept out to sea, but he also had on shoes and a watch. His estimated time of death was just a few hours prior to his body being found. There is just something about this man being so recognizable and being found so quickly that just really makes me feel like something sinister was going on here. He was estimated to be 25 to 40 years old. He was 6 foot 9 and 335 pounds with short brown hair and brown eyes and a clean shaven face. Anyone with information can contact Brittany McLaurin at the District 11 11 Miami-Dade County Medical Examiner's Office or Kenny Matthews at the Miami Beach Police Department. In our number one spot today, we have the Coney Island Creek Jane Doe, who also is known as Monique. In January of 2015, three bird watchers in a park in the Gravesend area of Brooklyn, Kings County, New York, found a decomposed right hand laying in the sand. The hand was right on the shoreline of Coney Island Creek, and it seemed as though it had been in the water for quite some time. The next day, authorities searched the area and found a foot, which had been smoothly cut around the ankle. For the next three months, they were unable to find any more parts until on March 22nd, three teenagers headed into a wooded area near the creek around 1,000 yards from where the other parts had been found. The teenager saw the skeleton of a rib cage and spine and of course called the police. Authorities searched again and found a leg on the ground and an elbow hanging from a tree. Upon examination, they could confirm that all parts belonged to the same person. There isn't much to go on, but it seems that this Jane Doe was put into the water and when they washed ashore, they were dragged to their different locations by animals. This Jane Doe is described as a black female from 20 to 45 years old. She was most likely around 5 foot 3 to 5 foot 9. Although a head was not found through through DNA mapping, it is most likely she had black hair and brown eyes. There has been a facial approximation made of what she may have looked like. She had a tattoo on her right calf that was red and green. It was a heart and a rose with the name Monique. Investigators are unsure if that was her name or the name of someone close to her. Other details are that she had a broken rib at some point in her life, and that she had a mesh artery stent within the tissue of her pelvis and an intrauterine device, which means that she has definitely had surgery before. Anyone with information on this case are asked to contact the New York City Police Department or the New York City Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. Or, if you wish to remain anonymous, you can do so by calling New York Crime Stoppers. Coming in number 10, we have Pierre Picot. If you are a well-read person, you might know the story of the Count of Monte Cristo. It's one of the most famous revenge stories of all time. But Jay, this video is titled Real Revenge Stories. Well, let me tell you that it's based on the real story of Pierre Picot. This guy was living in France back in the 19th century and this dude wasn't bothering anyone. He was a shoemaker and he just wanted to make some clogs for people to walk in and he wanted to hang out with his wife. He was a simple dude. Well this dude got betrayed by three of his so called friends. They all worked together to come up with a story that said Pierre was actually an English spy. The police believed this and they locked him up but once you take everything from a man you better make sure he dies because now all he has on his mind is revenge. Once Pierre was released from prison, he put together a plan to kill these three men and oh did he ever pull it off. One of the men, Lupin, would get the worst of the treatment. This Lupin guy actually married Picot's former wife, so Picot went out of his way to corrupt his children first, seducing them into a life of crime and then he killed their 
father. He destroyed their entire family first so the man would know he had nothing before he died. Coming in at number 9 we have Anderson Silva. Any MMA fan will remember when Chael Sonnen almost beat Anderson Silva to take the middleweight title. Before this it was thought that the champ was unbeatable but Chael showed that there was a crack in the armor. And after this close match everyone wanted a rematch which almost took 2 years to happen and in this time Chael went on a massive press tour bad mouthing Anderson in the worst way possible. He said horrible things about Anderson Silva's kids, he said horrible things about Anderson Silva's home country of Brazil. Basically Chael Sonnen was Conor McGregor before Conor McGregor was ever in the UFC. This built massive tensions between the two and Anderson Silva hated Chael Sonnen. He wanted his head on a platter and at UFC 148 he would get his wish. Anderson Silva would finish Chael Sonnen by TKO in the second round and remain the UFC middleweight champion and go on to be maybe the best fighter the UFC has ever seen. And guys remember to hit that like button because it really helps us out. Coming in number 8 we have Aaron Burr. Aaron Burr would try to run for political office several times and even had a shot at being president but lost to Thomas Jefferson and a lot of this was because of Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton went out of his way to ruin Burr's campaigns and one day Burr had enough. He was running for governor of New York and Hamilton screwed it up for him again. Burr challenged Hamilton to a duel and ended up killing him. Bang. Coming in at number 7 we have Harold Fisher versus Guido Rossi. Flying around a fighter plane during World War II would have been one of the most stressful things you could ever do. You would need to be sharp and ready to take on anyone at any moment. Well, right when Harold Fisher thought he was safe, it would turn out that he was under attack. Harold Fisher was a lieutenant flying a broken down bomber in World War II. The thing was barely going to make it back to base when he saw an American P-38 and thought he was saved. He thought it was a fellow ally. Well, it turns out that the plane had been commandeered by Guido Rossi, an Italian who tried to shoot down Fisher but was unsuccessful. When Fisher returned to base, he found out that Rossi was the one piloting the plane and he wanted revenge on him. So he asked his commanding officer if he could take out the YB-40, an experimental high powered fighter. They obliged but Fisher wanted to make sure that Rossi knew that he was the one gunning for him so he painted the likeness of Rossi's wife on the side of the plane. He really wanted to add insult to injury. Coming in at number 6 we have Buffered Pusser. I don't know why this happens but sometimes wrestlers leave the game of smashing people through tables and become some of the best elected officials around. Buffered Pusser was an elected sheriff in a town in Tennessee and he wasn't doing this just for show. As soon as he got into office he started taking on two different mobs and tried to shut them down. Now the thing is the mob wasn't going to take this lying down. They wanted Pusser dead. They tried to kill him several times. One time the mob put three bullets on him but he kept pushing forward. Well the mob would target his wife Pauline Pusser who would be shot and killed by four gunmen. Buffered Pusser wasn't going to let this slide. He was going to get his revenge on every single one of them. One of the men was put behind bars and the other three gunmen were gunned down in the street. This guy wasn't going to let the mob push him around and he got his revenge. Coming in at number 5 we have Frank Eaton. For this one we have to head back to the 19th century and swing over to the state of Kansas. Frank Eaton's father would go around and take out confederate troops who were still hanging around. Basically doing some cool Batman vigilante stuff. Well, five confederate soldiers eventually found Eaton's dad and killed them. Well, they killed the wrong dad because now Eaton wasn't going to rest until every single one of these men was dead. He started to train to become the fastest, most accurate gunman around. He was shooting faster than anyone had seen before and people started to call him Pistol Pete. Eventually, he was old enough to track these criminals down and one by one he took them out. There's only one dude who was able to get away from him and that's only because he died in an accident before Frank was able to catch up with him. The feeling of losing your father would have been horrible, but it must have been nice to catch those men and see them die. <laughs> Coming in at number 4 we have Lorena Bobbitt. Lorena Bobbitt would become famous in 1993 when she cut off her husband's p*****. See Lorena was married to John Bobbitt who was abusive and would cheat on her all the time. He was a horrible person who would go out of his way to demean and humiliate Lorena. He would come home after a night of cheating on her and tell her about it. Well one day she had enough and while John was sleeping she chopped off his wiener and threw it in a ditch. The wild thing is they were able to find his dongle and reattach it to his body. 
Very strange. Coming in number three, we have Jean Declassant. Hell knows no fury like a woman scorned. Jean Declassant and her husband were very wealthy people in 14th century France. They were in great relations with many of the people in the French royal family, or so they thought. One day they got an invitation from the French king and he was asking for them to come visit for a tournament. Well, turns out this was a trap. There had been rumors that Jean's husband had been supporting England through one of their many wars, and the French king didn't like this one bit, so he had her husband executed. Well, you messed with the wrong woman because she was going to spend every last waking moment of her life ruining the French Navy. She would sell everything she owned, all of her possessions, all of her property, everything, and she would buy three pirate ships. For the next 13 years, her and her crew would harass and destroy every French noble ship they found. And if any nobles were on board, they would be beheaded and killed in front of everyone. She would kill the entire crew except for one person so they could go tell the story. She became known as the Queen of Pirates. Coming at number two, we have Katie Coleman. I would hope that a fate even worse than this happens to anyone who harms people. Anthony Stockelman was a horrible person and he would kidnap and murder Katie Coleman. Luckily, police caught up with him and locked him up. He was sentenced to life in prison. But being in the big house where you get three square meals a day, even though prison is horrible, I would hope that something even more sinister would happen to something like this. Well, Katie Coleman would get some form of deeper justice because her cousin was in the same prison as Anthony Stockelman. He was in there for burglary, and one night he would hunt down Stockelman. He went into his cell with a few other inmates, they held him down, and he tattooed Katie's killer across his forehead. Forehead. This way, he would never be able to escape the horrible crimes he committed, and he would be treated terribly in prison by his fellow inmates, making sure that his time in the big house was hell on earth. And coming in at the number one spot, we have Marvin. Haymire. If you have seen the Netflix documentary Tread, then you will know everything that I'm about to talk about. But if you haven't, then you're about to hear one of the best revenge stories of all time. It all takes place in the town of Granby, Colorado. The town was failing and they needed to find some way to boost revenue and that was going to be through a concrete factory. So the whole town decided that they would build a factory but Marvin Haymire was going to get screwed over because where the factory was going to be put blocked off access to his muffin. Shop. So he tried to work with the town. He bought a Komatsu D335A bulldozer to build a new road to his shop, but the town refused and eventually shut off sewage to his shop. And then he started to get fined by the city, so he had to sell his entire life because the town was now trying to edge him out. And he later found out that his fiance was cheating on him. He was now in debt, heartbroken, and had no career, and he was stuck in a town that hated him and was trying to ruin him, and all he had was a bulldozer. So he built a tank. He welded massive metal plates all over the side of the whole thing so it was bulletproof. He had cameras at the base so he could see where he was driving, and he had food stores inside the tank so he could go on for days. And he had made gun ports so he could fire a rifle out of the tank. Then one cold morning, he got his revenge. He first destroyed the concrete plant, running his bulldozer right through it and destroying everything. Then he went through the town and destroyed things bit by bit. He destroyed the city hall. He destroyed the newspaper, talked crap about him. He destroyed businesses. He destroyed the mayor's house. He caused millions of dollars in damages. Eventually, the bulldozer got stuck and Haymeyer took his own life. Before he went on his rampage, he left a series of tapes with his brother. All of them detail his thoughts and motivations while building the bulldozer. In one of these, he says, I am not a slave to man. I am a slave to God. Hitchhiking Gone Seriously Wrong drives onto this list at number 10. One of the most common things that we've learned at a young age is to never get in a car with strangers. So I'm not sure how Uber really <laughs> persuade us to get in cars with strangers, but I guess Uber isn't hitchhiking. You actually know who's driving you, sort of. <laughs> But I know in certain countries, hitchhiking can be completely safe, but in America, it's definitely not one of those countries. I know places like in Cuba, I know hitchhiking is almost mandatory, and that's because the transit system there, it just doesn't exist. Well, I'm pretty sure it was in Cuba, but you have to actually pick someone up who's on the road, who's trying to get to work or go to school or something like that. So getting back to this, back on May 19th, 1977, Colleen Stan decided to hitchhike 400 miles from Oregon to California California so that she could surprise her friend for her birthday. Colleen was way less than 100 miles away from her final destination when she was 
picked up by Cameron Hooker. He was a 23 year old guy who was traveling with his wife and baby when he picked her up. But underneath that family man disguise was a very evil man. He forced Colleen to be his personal sex slave for seven years. So this guy actually kidnapped her and used her as a personal sex slave for the next seven years. During that time, she slept in a coffin like wooden box underneath their waterbed for 23 hours a day and was repeatedly tortured and abused. Colleen wasn't freed until 1984 when the man's wife helped her escape. Cameron Hooker was sentenced to 104 years in prison and thankfully he won't be out there to pick up any other victims. The girl next door takes us to number 9. Sylvia Likens was only 16 years old when she was abused and she was murdered by her caregiver Gertrude Benazuski and some of her other neighborhood kids. Gertrude and these other kids, some as young as 10 years old, tortured Sylvia for fun. I mean these kids sound like future serial killers. The kids would take turns beating her, hitting her against the wall and choke her until she passes out. Gertrude even put out her cigarettes on her skin and soon the others joined in too. The abuse gets even more intense, but I won't scar you guys with the details. Just know that these kids are literally so messed up and I'm sure they're locked behind bars now. Ultimately, Sylvia died due to brain swelling, internal hemorrhaging of the brain and shock. This is a really sad and depressing story, so let's move on. We have the real life Slenderman who stabs his way into number 8. Slenderman is a tall faceless man who lurks in the shadows. He preys on young children and has even convinced some of them to kill for him. Now that we're familiar with Slenderman, let me introduce you guys to a deranged 12 year old. In 2014, Morgan had a sleepover so she invited some of her friends from school. But that night, her plan didn't include eating birthday cake and blowing up candles. Morgan and her friends friend planned on honoring Slenderman by murdering their friends. The next morning they took their unsuspected friend to the woods and stabbed the poor girl 19 times all over her body. They thought that they brutally murdered her but thankfully she was discovered by a cyclist who immediately called 911. She had to have a lot of surgeries but the doctors actually managed to save her life. The girls admitted that they have had been planning the attacks for months so the judge sentenced them to spend a minimum of 25 years in a mental hospital. Who stabbed her first? I think um, and he stabbed her first, and then I continued, and then like she was like, Morgan, make sure she doesn't. Stranger Things in the Walls breaks onto this list at number 7. Do you sometimes get that weird feeling like uh, you're being watched or someone's watching behind you? Yeah, I get that feeling sometimes. What if I told you that someone could actually be living in your home? Okay, okay, that's, that's not the case for everybody, but for this family in particular, they got a lot more than they bargained for when they did some exploring in their home. A family just moved into their new home and everything seemed normal. However, they made a shocking discovery that will send chills down your spine. When the two young boys were playing around, they discovered a secret door behind the bookshelf in their parents' bedroom. They went down the secret staircase that led to a creepy crawl space and inside they found evidence that someone was living inside of their walls. They found food wrappers, statues, a key and some other creepy dolls. Oh, and the candy wrappers were actually from candy that the boys stashed in their rooms. So they've been stealing their stuff. And this creepy crawler has just been roaming the house as they sleep. I mean, yeah, after finding that out, good luck sleeping tonight. Hopefully they were able to catch them. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm about to check every wall inside of my place and make sure there's no secret crevices or secret rooms, you know, behind them. Flushing bacteria attacks us in at number six. Graduate student is now clinging to life in critical condition. By the time doctors realized what was happening, well, the flesh decaying infection had already devoured her leg muscles. Amy Copeland contracted a flesh eating bacteria when she fell from a homemade zip line. Note to self, never go zip lining on a sketchy homemade course. She went to the hospital where doctors treated her leg with 22 staples and then sent her on her way. But three days later, she was rushed to an emergency room in pain. That's when the doctors noticed she had necrotizing fasciitis. Surgeons had to amputate her hands, part of her abdomen, one of her legs, and one foot as well. She was also placed on a ventilator because she had kidney failure and other organ damage. I mean, just imagine going on vacation and wanting to be adventurous, but you end up getting a flesh-eating disease. That might be the worst vacation ever. Mommy Dead and Dearest creeps onto this list at number 5. 
This is a story about a mother and daughter who appear to be living in a fairy tale life, but in reality, they were living in a nightmare. I mean, go back in July of 2016, Gypsy Rose Blanchard was sentenced to 10 years in prison after pleading guilty to second degree murder in the brutal slaying of her mother. But let me explain. All of her life, Gypsy's mother told her that she was seriously sick and that she won't live to see her 18th birthday. Her mother shaved Gypsy's hair to fake cancer. She made Made her get a painful feeding tube. She lied to her daughter about how old she was. Gypsy's teeth rotted out. She was forced to take harmful prescription drugs and she was forced to use a wheelchair and pretended that she was paralyzed from the waist down. This is a serious form of child abuse. Gypsy was in a wheelchair. She had leukemia and she was having seizures and she had to be tube fed. And then gradually that story fell apart. Things are not always as they appear. This is a tragic event surrounded by mystery and public deception. People thought of us as the sweetest mother, daughter, best people in the world. A horrible hiking accident climbs this list at number 4. This scary story is about Diet Love Pass, who had an incident which is probably one of the creepiest mysteries in Russian history. Back in 1959, 9 students went hiking in the wilderness and they never came out. A search party was sent to find them, but they weren't expecting to see this. They found their campsite, but the tents were cut open from the inside and all of their stuff were untouched. They followed the snowy footprints and over the course of 2 months, they were able to find all of the bodies. Despite the very cold temperatures, all of the bodies have little clothing on. Some of the bodies had major internal injuries that would be similar to being hit by a car. And what makes things even weirder is that there was no external wounds. One of the bodies has brain damage but zero physical damage to their skull. One woman was missing her tongue, eye and part of her lips and some of her facial tissues as well. No one knows what happened on that mountain even to this day. This case is still unsolved. The underground bunker brings us to number 3. Elizabeth Schof was approached by a person claiming to be a police officer. She was 14 years old at the time the man handcuffed her and walked her into the woods. He held her captive in an underground bunker that that he dug by hand and kept her there for 10 days. And picked up a piece of ground. And then she realized it was a trap door. There was a bunker down there. During that time, he abused her many, many times, but the young girl managed to come up with a plan. She tried to earn his trust and make him believe that she was okay with the situation. She actually convinced him to let her use his cell phone to play games on, but she was actually texting her parents and friends for help. The police were able to find her location and rescue her from this underground bunker. Go down the ladder and get into the bunker. He had like a rifle and a belt that had guns and handcuffs and I saw a taser in it. So I knew he was well equipped to do anything if I acted. Digging into number two, we have a woman who was buried alive. Is anyone else starting to panic? I think being buried alive would be one of the worst ways to die. But for Michelina, she knew she had to keep on fighting. Well, let's rewind for a sec and go back to the beginning of the story. Michelina was in a very unhealthy and unstable relationship with her fiance, Marcin. One day, Marcin hired an accomplice and attacked his fiance with a stun gun. He tied up her limbs, put her in a cardboard box, and drove out into the wilderness where he wanted to bury the mother of his child alive. So we dug a shallow grave and put a 90 pound tree branch so that she would suffocate. Once she woke up, she could only think about her son and how she needed to survive so she could protect him. So she cut through the rope with her engagement ring. Well, I guess the ring was good for one thing. And then she clawed herself out of her grave. Even though she managed to escape from this horrifying experience, she is still haunted to this day with severe paranoia and insomnia. Escaping Jeffrey Dahmer takes us to number one. Wanted to have the person under my complete control uh, to do with as I wanted. Jeffrey Dahmer is one of the most terrifying and infamous serial killers of all time. 
He killed and dismembered 17 young men in the late 70s and early 90s. He converted his apartment in Milwaukee into his own personal torture chamber where he would lure innocent victims and use them for medical experiments, necrophilia, and sometimes he would eat them. One day he invited Tracy Edwards over to drink beer and watch The Exorcist 3. But when Tracy Edwards arrived, he quickly discovered that Jeffrey Dahmer was nothing more than an evil and scary predator. Jeffrey Dahmer used a butcher knife to scare Tracy and he even said that he was going to eat his heart. Tracy just kept trying to keep calm and once he was able to distract the killer, he hit him with the blunt object and ran onto the streets. He was able to flag down a police car which led them to the apartment where they found a ton of body parts including four human heads in the fridge. I mean what the heck. Number 10 we have Caesar Villa's essay. Caesar Villa was a prisoner in a California penitentiary and after some of the guards declared that he was a gang member, they decided that it was was time to lock him away in solitary confinement for mm, an unknown amount of time. After he was released, he wrote an essay about what it felt like going through that torment. He spoke about how the first three weeks he slowly started to see himself slipping and the isolation sucked. By the end of the first year, he talked about how he was extensively exposed to the cold, which caused his hands and feet to split open and he was bleeding constantly, but he was never given any sort of bandages to cover up his wounds because resources like this are not permitted. After three years locked away in a box, he said that his psyche started to fade. When he looked back at that moment, he can pinpoint that as the moment where he knew that would change forever. He struggled to keep his mind focused and his memory started to feel like jumbled mess. It's a wild essay to read and it gives you firsthand insight what it was like to go through such an isolation, being in isolation in a solitary confinement. Number nine, not everyone's a monster. All right, let's continue on this list of the dark solitary confinement story. At number 9, we have Not Everyone's a Monster. Their perspective on the other side can let us know that not even the guards like what's happening in these prisons. A corrections officer posted on Reddit about how watching inmates get forced into solitary confinement was the worst part of his job. You could see people break and it was disgusting to see. The corrections officers didn't want to see the inmates hurt or tormented. They just wanted to come in and do their job and just leave without being harmed or seeing the inmates and convicts harmed. This Reddit poster talked about a particular incident where a warden forced someone to stay in solitary confinement for a minor offense. They were shoved into a room that had no bed and there was literally just a shower. They stayed there for three days and started to self harm because they just couldn't take it. They were going crazy. The person was removed and afterwards the warden was fired. So before you get into number eight, make sure you guys hit the like button because it really helps us out. It really helps us out with the algorithms. It gets us recommended to you guys. All right, number eight, we have William Blake. Well, William Blake has has been in solitary confinement for over 25 years and he's still surviving there. Is this real life right now? 25 years of anything is way too long. He continues to write about his experience stuck in his cell in an article titled A Sentence Worse Than Death. He talks about feeling loneliness and boredom that seem to be so powerful they have a physical effect on his body, like a pressure just seeping in. Every day in solitary confinement was like a constant battle to hold on to your own psyche. He has seen many men lose the battle with the box, have their minds slip away, and slowly but surely go insane from the pressure of being alone every day, all day for years at a time. But he said what is even worse than that is when the guards walk into a cell and they find a man hanging from the ceiling. Very tragic, many of the people that are forced into solitary confinement aren't going to make it to the point where they are released or lose their mind. They're going to end up suffering on their own terms. Number seven, Reddit confession. Reddit user Jesus broke down what their experience in solitary confinement was. About how they felt as if they're going insane from being forced to stay in the same cell for who knows how long. The lights in the cell were kept on all the time. There was never an escape from the glow shining down on him, confusing his mind to what day it was because he doesn't know when it's nighttime. It's always daytime for him. It's always the same day for him. Thankfully, our Reddit user had a bulletproof window that he can look outside if he stood on his toes. So he needs to go up there, which means, you know, that's the only time he can actually see out. This was his only connection with the outside world. It's pretty sad if you asked me. And moving right along, just like that, at number six, we have agrophobia. I didn't even know that this was a thing. I mean, I don't know about a lot of these phobias that I've been reading about. Well, this article that I was reading is from the Marshall Project. It's an interview with a prisoner who was in solitary confinement for 22 years. Agoraphobia is basically the opposite of claustrophobia. When 
people must be in smaller spaces or they start to have panic attacks. The prisoner said that the last five years of his time in solitary confinement, he didn't leave his cell like at all. Could you guys imagine that? I, I can't imagine that at all. When he was first locked away in solitary, he would leave his cell to go to the yard and exercise, but one day that all changed. He stepped out and it felt like the air around him was just crushing him, like his heart was going to explode. He smashed on the door until they opened it, and when the door opened, he wasn't running out of his cell, he was running in his cell. The guards would sometimes use this to aggravate him. They would threaten to pull him out, out of his cell. I mean, this is really sad. Is this real life right now? This shouldn't be a fear to be outside of your cell. This guy just can't handle freedom at all. He would lay in his cell and make up an imaginary life for himself. He would picture himself going on dates, getting married, raising children, an entire fantasy life all inside of his mind. Something to provide him with joy while being too afraid to leave the box. Number five. I probably did like 17 years, 18 years in segregation. Um, and I did long stretches. It was short times, but the longest one was 10 years. I well, that, that was Danny, AKA Beast. Two separate prison sentences, a 24 and a 16 split. First locked up in 1977, he spent 10 straight years in solitary, but that wasn't the only time. He was in and out of segregation throughout the entirety of his two prison sentences. He is one of the lucky ones who got out and back into society, and now he's partnered with a YouTube channel, After Prison, where his life showcased and dissected his regard to his haunting experiences. I was happy having trouble mentally and dealing with segregation for so long. Number four, Ashley Smith. Okay. Stay still, Ashley. You got any more of this? Okay, so this one hits close to home. Being from, well, Toronto, Canada, where we film right now, just a short drive away, Kitchener, Ontario, Canada, Ashley Smith committed suicide by strangling herself to death while prison guards watched and videotaped. Yet, they did not stop her. She did this because she was placed in solitary confinement for 1,047 days. That's just over three years. Although Ashley had reportedly suffered from mental illnesses, her case was fought and ultimately her death was ruled as a homicide, not a suicide. I totally would agree with that because the sheer negligence of those that watched her and didn't try to save her. Hopefully those people just feel awful about themselves and I hope they get to see the inside of solitary confinement. Keith Lamar comes in at number three. Keith Lamar was only a teenager when he was in prison for killing someone and missed a drug deal gone wrong. A few years later, he was moved into solitary confinement where he stayed for 27 years. He wasn't even able to go outside in that time. The closest thing he had ever to go outside was the open air underground, a wreck cage, which is this metal confinement they use for recreational. Fortunately, he does have some belongings in his six by 10 cell. To quote him, he said, I've been lucky in a lot of ways. My cell has a bookshelf with three shelves and there is a table to sit and write. I have a lot of music and books to read, not to distract myself from myself, but to take deeper into myself. I paint, I work out, I do yoga, I meditate. I meditate for an article written recently about how to handle quarantine and being alone during 2020 COVID pandemic. He is still currently serving a sentence and is waiting execution in 2023. So in a number two, we have another dark story told. This story said, I've been on a roller coaster up and down. I really had some bad times, some bad thoughts. You just start thinking along lines of maybe this is it. Maybe this is how I'm going to end. Soon Suicide is probably one of the main things down here. And he also said, I'm pretty much going through that. I was going to end my life. I don't think I can do it. I don't think I can stay down here in the hole that long. Well, this was a direct quote from Richard Wolf. A man who experienced 640 days in solitary confinement. His brother is shown holding a photo of Richard who died in prison when he collapsed in the exercise yard. And this is during the one hour a day he was allowed outside due to underlining heart conditions that were never met with appropriate medical attention. And we have Albert Woodfox at number one. We've talked about him many times. Well, this right here is Albert Woodfox. Well, he was kept in solitary confinement for, okay, wait for it. You guys won't believe it. 
you're never gonna believe how long he did, not just in prison, but in solitary confinement. Well, if your guess was 43 years, you would be correct. He was first placed in there when he was accused of murdering a prison guard, something he denies to this day and believes that he was framed or there was funny business going on. The prison had no viable reason to keep him in a six foot by nine foot concrete box by himself for that long, but they did, allowing Albert only one hour of solo yard time a day while he remained shackled. So you're in a cage outside for an hour, but yet you still have to be shackled. In the last year of prison, they cut that down to just three hours a week. I'm blown away by how absolutely awful this is. That poor man is finally out of prison and he's in his early 70s. Imagine being there for a crime you never committed. Well, there you guys have it. Thank you guys so much for watching. I was your host, Landon Dallas Singh, and I'll see you guys all in the next one.